Friends, good morning. Good morning. Grace to you and peace in the name of God, our Father, and His Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. It's truly a joy to be gathered for worship. And as our time of worship begins, I do want to add a name to your prayer list. The name to add is that of John Ship. Uh, this is a prayer request that was passed along to me by Anda Spain, who mentioned that he is suffering from lung cancer. So we certainly do want to include John in our prayers this morning. Uh, there's also a note in your bulletin uh, about a special program we're having here on April 10th. Uh, if you want to turn to the second to last page under the title Point Counterpoint, Scripture and Music. It is a program being presented by Bob Reynolds um, and we look forward to that opportunity the evening of April 10th. That's Palm Sunday and uh, we look forward to having you here and would encourage you to invite friends to attend as well. With that calendar announcement, uh, let me now turn uh, my attention or turn our attention to our moment for mission. I'll invite Kara Angel forward to share about that. to those who receive, as well as the uh, ongoing efforts of our responding to the needs in our community through, uh, th through the schools as they communicate with us what those needs are. With those announcements being shared this morning, may we turn our hearts and minds to the purpose for which we have gathered today, and may we <laughs> allow ourselves to know that we are in the presence of God who has promised to be present where two or more are gathered in his name. May we be led into this time of worship as the music of the prelude helps us prepare our hearts and minds.
God is blessing us with springs of living water. God is sending us to sing, pray, and witness every day. God is here. Let the conversation begin. And will you stand and join in singing, Let All Things Now Living, hymn number 500.
worshiping with us to the front of the sanctuary for a special message just for you. reading today comes from Joshua chapter 5, beginning in the ninth verse where we read, The Lord said to Joshua, Today I have rolled away from you the disgrace of Egypt, and so this place is called Gilgal to this day. While the Israelites were camped in Gilgal, they kept the Passover in the evening on the fourteenth day of the month in the plains of Jericho. On the day after the Passover, on that very day, they ate the produce of the land, unleavened cakes and parched grain. The manna ceased on the day they ate the produce of the land, and the Israelites no longer had manna. They ate the crops of the land of Canaan that year. Turning to our second reading, we read now from 2 Corinthians chapter 5, which Michelle shared some of with the children. This letter of Paul, or this segment of the letter of Paul to the Corinthian church, beginning in the 16th verse, reads this way. From now on, therefore, we regard no one from a human point of view. Even though we once knew Christ from a human point of view, we know him no longer in that way. So, if anyone is in Christ, there is a new creation. Everything old is passed away. See, everything has become new. And this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. 
that is, in Christ God, was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors, ambassadors for Christ. Since God is making his appeal through us, we entreat you on behalf of Christ, be reconciled to God for our sake. He made him to be sin who knew no sin, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And now may the words of my mouth and the meditation of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, O Lord, for you are our rock and you are our redeemer. Amen. I'd like to begin. I don't need a show of hands, but I would like a little feedback. Uh, but if you were to go to Washington, D.C., what time of year would you want to go? Probably about this time of year. What would you see in Washington about this time? The cherry blossoms. Where, where do those bloom? Is there a particular spot all throughout D.C.? The basin. The basin. Okay, the basin. Right, exactly. Other particular spots in D.C., if you went to see the cherry blossoms, where else would you want to go? Smithsonian. Smithsonian Museums, okay. Located in various spots throughout the city. And I want to direct your attention to one particular street in D.C. that you might find of interest if you find yourself there doing sightseeing for the cherry blossoms and for the Smithsonian maybe the Capitol and the White House as well. But how about Massachusetts Avenue? If you find yourself to be driving down, to, down Massachusetts Avenue, and this would be any time of the year, cherry blossoms or not, um, but you would be sure on that street to see large stately mansions, magnificent in size, magnificent in their appearance. They're lining that street. The styles of architecture of these buildings would be different from one to the next. But all of these grand houses have one thing in common. All of them, or each of them, I should say, has a very colorful flag out front. Yet the colorful flag out front is not that of our stars and stripes. Even though in our nation capital, as you can imagine, American flags are quite numerous, but they're not numerous in this section of Massachusetts Avenue. These are the flags of foreign countries. And the section of Massachusetts Avenue I'm talking about is known as Embassy Row. This is a nickname, and it is a nickname it alone tells us what we need to understand about why those different flags are flying there on that street. Each of those imposing and impressive buildings is an embassy. And an embassy is a little piece of another nation embedded there in our nation's capital. Were you to walk up to the door of one of these embassies, and were you at that doorstep to be admitted, as you step across the threshold of that door, you would actually be leaving the jurisdiction of the United States of America, and as long as you remain within that embassy compound, you would be outside of our nation, technically speaking. Also, it might be helpful to remember if a crime is ever committed inside the embassy, there in, in Washington, D.C., the, the police there have zero, no jurisdiction over that crime. In fact, neither does the FBI. You see, it's upon the nation whose embassy it is to deal with the situation under its own laws. These are principles that are honored by time. Even revolution, the embassies of other nations are generally left alone. We've seen this happen in recent months, in our own time, as Taliban soldiers waited outside the U.S. Embassy in Kabul. They waited until the last U.S. Marine Guard had departed the compound, honoring even in that sense, setting and situation, the space Another case in point would be in 1956, there was a Soviet uh, revolution or, or Soviet tanks were rolling into Budapest, Hungary, and there was a strongly anti-communist Roman Catholic cardinal. His name was Joseph 
Medzinsky, and he took refuge in the U.S. Embassy there in Budapest. He lived there for not one, not two, not five, not ten, but for 15 years, never venturing out. Had he, in that setting, so much as ventured to set, set, uh, set foot on the cobblestone sidewalks outside, certainly the communist secret police would have arrested him. They would have done so instantly. But they didn't dare come across the threshold of that door. They didn't dare come into the embassy to arrest him and to seize him. Why? Because he was under the personal protection of the American ambassador. This being said, in our recent history, and by recent history I mean in the last 50 years, there was one noticeable exception, of course, to this diplomatic community. It is what they call in diplomatic circles the October Surprise. Do you remember the October Surprise and what it is all about? Briefly, I'll summarize it saying this way. In October 1979, radical Iranian students stormed the U.S. Embassy in Tehran. They made hostages of everyone, everyone who was inside. Most of those were released soon after. Most of those did not include 52 embassy staffers who were imprisoned in that building. Imprisoned without charges, imprisoned without trial for 444 days. It was a breach of protocol, as, as you can imagine, a scandalous breach of international law, and a large part of the reason why the United States still doesn't have good diplomatic relations with Iran, this more than a generation later. This invisible boundary that set the embassy compound off as a little piece of America had been transgressed and disrespected. I say all these things about embassies in our nation, in other nations, to say this. Understanding embassies helps us explain something that the Apostle Paul is writing to the Corinthian church about in the portion of the letter we read today. So we are ambassadors for Christ, since God is making his appeal through us. The we, of course, that Paul is referring to is he and his co-workers. We can easily extend that meaning of we to include all Christians ourselves as well, because representing Christ to the world is something we are all called to do in our response to God, in our response in faith. William Barclay is a name that's probably familiar to you. He's a biblical scholar and a commentator, and he observes that in the Roman Empire, when it was time to form a new province, ambassadors played a key role. Let's say, for example, the Roman army has just conquered a new territory. It did this quite a bit, right? Well, then the military governor would rule it for a while, but eventually the Senate, back in Rome, would dispatch a team. And this team would consist of ten ambassadors to the place. Ambassadors in this would be the same Greek word that we read in our scripture today. It would be the job of these ten individuals that job of these ten people, the job of these ten ambassadors to determine the boundaries of the new province, province, pardon me, the boundaries of the new province, and to draw up a constitution for its new administration. And then they would return and submit what they have done to be ratified by the Senate of Rome. They are the men responsible for bringing others into the family of the Roman Empire. They, the ambassadors, Barclay writes, are the men responsible for bringing others into the family of the Roman Empire. So the Apostle Paul thinks of himself as the man who brings others to the terms of God whereby they can become citizens of God's kingdom, God's empire, and members of God's family. I think Barclay hits the nail on the head with that observation. Indeed, and it's very helpful. But it leaves us asking a question about ourselves. Do we, do we as Christians here and now today see ourselves as that kind of ambassador for Christ? And do we see the church as an outpost for God's love and God's justice in a territory that's otherwise quite hostile to such things? 
maybe even indifferent in some ways, to the good news of Jesus Christ. Think of that, if you will. The church as an embassy of heaven, and we ambassadors for it. Walk through these doors. Walk into this place. And you're leaving the United States of America, even in the community of nations. Or, pardon me. You're leaving behind the United States of America, and even the community of nations leaving it behind in a certain sense. You see within these walls, different rules, different laws apply. The law of love, not the law of coercion. The law of justice, not the laws of might makes right, and looking out for number one. At least that's the church at its best. Not every church certainly lives up to that ideal, and no church lives up to it all the time. The church is, after all, just as much a human institution as it is divine. And the church, not just our church, but the church universal, has more than its share of faults and foibles. We are all too aware of this. Paul knows it as well. And he knows it as well as anyone. His Corinthian letters are exercises in conflict Resolution Again and again and again, he's giving advice to the Corinthians about how they can best live as people of God, as disciples of Jesus. And in so doing, how they can seek unity rather than division. Paul never abandons in all of his writings this ideal of the embassy of heaven or himself and his fellow servants as its ambassadors, ambassadors of Christ, he says. I think it's hardly the job description that most of us would imagine for ourselves, but most assuredly it is who we are if we hear Paul's words and understand them. Whether we like it or not, we went in training for this duty the day we were baptized. And whether we acknowledge it or not, we are still in training for this role here and now today. So growing up into the full stature of Christ, to use another one of Paul's phrases, the full stature of Christ is a lifelong task, but if we've taken the step of becoming a church member, we've also been handed our ambassador's credentials. We possess those as well. We come and we go, shuttling between this church community and the world outside our walls. We travel Freely to and from the world, rubbing elbows with Christians and non-Christians alike. And everywhere we find ourselves, everywhere we go, we can expect to be, be viewed by others as Christ's ambassadors. This is true whether we like it or not. Think of uh, Charles Barkley saying, I'm not a role model. Isn't that who, who was quoted that way? As we are here in the NCAA uh, time of year, we're seeing quite a bit of Charles Barkley, and if you'll remember, there was a time where he said, I'm not a role model, and everybody looked, watching said, Charles, of course you're a role model. People are watching you. You're a role model whether you like it or not. Well, the same is true for us. Not in the same sense of the Charles Barkley quote, but people are watching us, and they know that we call ourselves Christians. So whether we like it or not, that tag of Christ's ambassador is visible to those watching us. Here's a frightening thought. The only way some people will, will experience the love of God in Jesus Christ is if disciples like you and me demonstrate it for them. Is that scary? Well, some days more than others. And the words of the old hymn continue to be true for every sort of Christian. Christ has no hands but our hands to do his work each day. He has no feet but our feet to lead men in his way. He has no tongues but our tongues to tell men how he died. He has no help but our help to bring them to his side. You see, the work that we do, the work of being an ambassador for Christ is crucially important. And in this culture in which we live, in this world in which we find ourselves daily, we notice that things bear labels like unchurched, and that's increasingly so. And at times, 
the society we live in is even hostile to those who claim the Christian faith. And so what do we do or what do we fail to do in our human interactions? Or let me turn that from a question into a statement. What we do or what we fail to do in our human interactions can and does make a great deal of difference in the world. You've probably heard a story of Gandhi, Mohandas Gandhi, the man who led India to independence from the British Empire. He became renowned the world over as a man of deep faith and a man of deep principles. But again, you've probably heard this story of when he was a young man living in London and he became fascinated with Jesus Christ. He once told a friend how he had read the New Testament and discovered in Jesus' command to turn the other cheek the foundation for his principle of nonviolent resistance. Tell me then, his friend asked, if you admire Christ so much, why don't you become a Christian? Gandhi is said to have replied with a twinkle in his eye, when I meet a Christian who is a follower of Christ, I may consider it. Ooh, that stings, doesn't it? Saying something about what he observes in the lives of the Christians that he knows, something that is a bit of a disconnect between what they claim to profess and how they live. And it sounds like the young Gandhi was searching for a true ambassador of Christ, but never found one. Think of that missed opportunity, if you will. If Gandhi had become a Christian, how huge would that have been? All of India, not to mention the world, could have profoundly been touched by the gospel. He did touch the world in significant ways. He was committed for people of all faiths. And it would have been even more impressive in many in the minds of many had he done it from a Christian perspective. What if he had met Christ by meeting a Christian who actually lived the faith that they professed? What might have been had he taken that further step having encountered someone in his life? And though it's true that we can look at Christians and admit that yes, we are all sins and fall short of the glory of God, and we understand, in a sense, our own hypocrisy. Occasionally, we do hear a story that gets to the heart of the matter. Occasionally, we hear a story of people who do it right. People who, for whatever reason, do manage, by the way they live their lives, to offer a, a glimpse, even if it's just a small sliver of a glimpse, of what it must be like to live in heaven. I ask you as we wind things up this morning to dial the clock with me back to 2006 when something like this happened. It was um, famously a little Amish village known as Nickel Mines. Nickel Mines is in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. And you may recall the sad and tragic story in one sense, but the impressive story in, in another sense. The, the story begins with a deranged man who's a neighbor from outside the Amish community walks into the village's one-room schoolhouse. He walks in with a gun and he takes a group of the children in that schoolhouse hostage. It wasn't but a short while later before five of those young girls were dead. Shot execution style in the back of each of their heads. Five other children were wounded, and the gunman himself committed suicide. It would have been a trauma of an un unimaginable size and, and standing for any community. But you think it would have been especially devastating for this tight-knit, small religious group of nonviolent people like the Amish. The world waited. Waited and watched waited and watched to see how the elders of this radical pacifist community would respond to this tragedy. What the world saw, what the world witnessed, was a remarkable Christian expression. One of the first things that Amish community did was to reach out to the gunman's widow and children. They brought them food, if you can imagine. Food, 
food for the family of their children's murderer. And they raised money. They raised money to help them pay their bills because on top of everything else in this complicated situation, they lost their principal wage earner and their family. We have to forgive, an Amish woman told the reporter for Reuters News Agency. We have to forgive, we have to forgive him in order for God to forgive us. Sounds like someone who understands a particular line in the Lord's Prayer, does it not? And then 10 days after that tragedy, 10 days after the shooting, a bulldozer came and crashed through the walls of that Amish schoolhouse in Nickel Mines. I say that because I want to also say that anyone who knows anything about the Amish knows that bulldozers are not their style, not by a long shot, right? They don't use heavy machinery. And besides, they're a thrifty bunch. So when they're demolishing a building, the men of the community typically de descend upon it with nail pullers and with crowbars. And they salvage everything of value, the lumber and the nails that they can for their next project. You've seen and heard of a barn raising, right? Well, think of this as the opposite of a barn raising. Yet on this occasion, the Amish didn't do that. They hired an outside non-Amish contractor. And they hired him to drive his bulldozer through that building to reduce it to splinters, to reduce it to a simple pile of rubble because they wanted the world to see that they were absolutely determined to forgive and forget and to do it quickly. These radical Christians, to these radical Christians, that public witness was well worth the cost of hiring this outside bulldozer for forsaking and forsaking the salvage value of the scrap lumber of that schoolyard and that school building. And it's an example that's in sharp contrast to the sort of thing we typically see in the news after a tragic murder is. We've had more than our fair share of school shootings, and often we see the family members saying something like, we want to see the one who did this come to justice. And that's understandable. They have a right as victims of crime to have this desire in their lives. But the Amish community in Nickel Mines, for them this idea of closure is evidently very different than that of most other people and most other mindsets in our country. And maybe, just maybe, it's because the Amish in some ways don't live in our country more than most Americans. Their home community is indeed within the walls of the embassy of was a Protestant pastor from the Nickel Mines area that told the story of sitting in the kitchen of the Roberts family. That's the family of the gunman. He was there a short time after the shootings. As reported in Lancaster Online, their version of the CKNJ. And the story says there was a knock at the door. The knock at the door was an Amish man, a neighbor. And he said he had come on behalf of his community. Burley farmer walked right up to Robinson's father, the gunman's father, put his arms around him and held him for what seemed to be an hour. Then he said, quite simply, we will forgive you. He and his community were indeed as good as their word. And reflecting back on the experience later, this pastor telling this story through this small town newspaper concluded, God met us. God met us in that kitchen. And so for you and for me, the message is quite plain. There are all sorts of ways to be ambassadors for Christ. And once in a great while, there comes a special opportunity for a spectacular witness like that of the Amish farmer. But more often, what we have is a multitude of small opportunities to bear witness in word or in deed. In our manner of life is being good models of the love of Christ and understanding that doing so is vitally important to our own faith and to the life of the church at large. Sometimes there's just no substitute for offering an explicit invitation to become better acquainted with Jesus Christ. We've all heard communicate the gospel of time or 
communicate the gospel at all times. Use, use words if necessary. And friends, I just want to say sometimes it is necessary for us to take that extra step to make sure people not just know the example of Christ through our words and actions, but feel invited into the presence of Christ by us saying something very simply like, would you come and join us? Silent witness is indeed powerful. But spoken words are good too, right? We're not too far off from Palm Sunday and Easter. And those are two days out of the year when a high percentage of people, sometimes who don't have much connection to local congregations, are maybe thinking about attending worship service. We joke, of course, about Christmas and Easter attenders. I, one of my pastor friends calls them priesters, right? Anyway, maybe they'll make it here on their own. Maybe they won't. One thing would sure be helpful, though, and that's if you and I added a thoughtful invitation to them, spoken from an ambassador, inviting them to an embassy gay lie, if you will. And there's a higher purpose to this invitation as well, and it's a purpose that goes just beyond having a few more people present in our church pews. Pardon me. And our passage today. Our 2 Corinthians passage explains this greater purpose. You see, right after identifying himself and his co-workers as ambassadors for Christ, Paul says this, We entreat you on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. Whether our friends, whether our neighbors make it to worship in the next few weeks is not the point, not the point at all. Getting here is just a means to an end. But what we are inviting them to more than that, ultimately, is not to walk into a building, but an opportunity to be reconciled to God, an opportunity to respond to our Savior's gracious invitation to wait, make their way back home, a home that they might not even know they are missing, but a home where everything, everything old passes away, and a world where everything Everything, all things are made new. You and I, we can be a part of that joyous welcome. You and I can and should be ambassadors for Christ as well. Amen and amen. And as our worship continues this morning, may we stand and lift our voices again to 413. All who love and serve your city.
state our belief in the historic confession of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Thank you and please be seated and may our worship continue as we bring God these, this presentation of our gifts in the presentation of tithes and offerings.
giving back to you with hopes and prayers and <coughs> humble thoughts, asking that you would receive these our gifts as an expression of our faith and as a means of supporting your ongoing work through the ministry and mission of this, your church. We pray in your holy name, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. Please remain standing as we draw our morning service to its conclusion as we sing hymn 285, God, you spin the world in heavens. And again, if you are wanting to be a part of this in the upcoming week, it's pants and shorts of an elastic -y kind of nature, right? Stretchy pants. Stretchy pants. Yeah. And uh, starting at size 4T up through uh, adult, small, medium, and large. And focusing more, or the need is greater for females. Yes. Okay. Again, a wonderful way to shower blessings upon our community. And as we go, may we not just shower blessings upon them, but may we be ambassadors for Christ, as Paul urges us each to be. And so doing, may we go also with the blessing of God Almighty, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace, peace that passes understanding today and always. Amen and amen. Thank you.
Yeah, I'm not landing, but it's nice. It's lovely. I'm not going to land. Yeah, I'm landing. Get some shades. Yeah, right.